long before Resident Evil convinced an entire generation that mansions are scary, Stanley Kubrick and Stephen King made the convincing argument that there's nothing more terrifying than being snowed in at a haunted hotel. Perhaps somebody should have told that to Nicole Wilson, the star of the new horror game The Suicide of Rachel Foster. She's about to spend a tension-filled week investigating an old abandoned hotel. Poor Nikki has no idea what's in store for her. Yeah, perhaps somebody should have forced her to watch The Shining. It's the early 90s and Helena, Montana is about to have their biggest snowstorm in decades. That's certainly inconvenient for Nicole, who is braving the bad weather in order to visit the now shuttered hotel that she grew up in as a kid. This is not what you would call a happy homecoming, though, because the woman is still grieving over the recent loss of her mother and really only going back to meet with the lawyer about selling the hotel. As far as she's concerned, this is going to be quick and simple, ending with her back on the road before the sun even goes down. As I'm sure you've figured out by now, things do not go as planned. First, the lawyer doesn't show up, and then Nicole gets snowed in by the blizzard. This forces her to not only eat a lot of canned beans, but also confront the long-buried trauma associated with this cursed hotel. She, along with a young FEMA agent named Irving, begin to investigate the shocking events surrounding the suicide of Rachel Foster back in the 1980s. But what starts out as a simple way to pass time quickly turns into something a lot more terrifying. This is what I would call a slow burn horror game. The suicide of Rachel Foster deliberately takes its time setting everything up, lulling you into a false sense of security as you poke around the hotel looking for clues. A lot of the adventure involves you picking up items and solving incredibly simple puzzles, all while Nicole reminisces about her childhood. In fact, these conversations with Irving make up the bulk of the story, giving you a real sense of who these characters are. There are times when she'll get off the phone and then immediately call him back. And this isn't just a few times, but constantly. Nicole is not good on her own. Now, a lot of the reason why this game is so effective is because hotels are inherently fun to explore, even more so when they're abandoned and in disrepair. This one is filled with secret rooms and passages, but even the garage and back offices are fun to discover. I like how the attention to detail helps to sell the lived-in feel, all of which helps to make the second half of the game that much more disturbing. It's a small hotel, and you'll see a lot of the same rooms and hallways many times, but everything from the dining room to the museum to the video game arcade have a lot of personality that is different from most horror games. The deliberately paced start will also take you off guard, setting up a scenario that really could go a number of different ways. I mean, I had my suspicions based on the clues and evidence, but I was never sure where the mystery would take Nicole. Admittedly, it takes a little while for the investigation to get started, and I like that. The game does a good job of introducing us to Nicole and Irving, all while planting seeds in your head that could grow into something bigger. I definitely don't want to give too much away or spoil the multiple endings. But I think it's safe to say that most people will find the twists and turns to be largely satisfying. Unfortunately, the way that the suicide of Rachel Foster tells its story didn't always work for me. Sometimes literally. Because so much of the narrative is conveyed through the phone conversations, you can probably imagine how frustrating it was when the voice acting glitched out. Look, I don't know if this is a problem with every version, but the PlayStation 4 port has this issue where Irving's dialogue would occasionally disappear. It would just never trigger. Nicole would still choose the dialogue options and hold the phone up to her head, but there was nobody on the other side. That is, until the audio jarringly returns in the middle of an important message. The fact that this happened more frequently towards the end of the game was frustrating because I kept worrying that I would miss an important clue or twist. And the truth is, I did miss important information because of the glitched audio. I found myself walking around in circles not knowing what to do because of a dropped line of dialogue. I had to watch a playthrough on YouTube just to figure out what Irving was saying. 
Then again, if I'm being honest, this game has a bad habit of not telling us what we're supposed to be doing. Sometimes you'll get clues in the conversations, but far more frequently you'll have to look at the map for the current objective. The developers use the objective text like a crutch when they should have found a more organic way to keep the player up to speed with what to do. Speaking of which, I'm not a big fan of the way the suicide of Rachel Foster is structured. Each chapter is revealed to be a different day, constantly reminding us how long Nicole has spent in the hotel. I like that, at least in theory. The problem is that Nicole only has one or two tasks every day, all of which can be completed in just a few minutes. One day, she'll have to turn on the furnace, and that's it. Another day, she'll have a scary dream, and that's it. On yet another day, she'll have to turn on the emergency power generator, and that's it. Sure, she's also talking to Irving, but let's be honest, she doesn't get much done. It gives off the impression that Nicole is either really lazy or constantly sleeping. Pretty much everything she does in the game could have been completed in like a day or maybe even over a weekend. There's absolutely no reason to drag the days out like that. And I found that this ultimately made the story a lot less believable. Look, between the slow burn and the entire days where not much happens, I can imagine some gamers growing bored waiting for the scares. Personally, I like that the tension comes from the reveals and not cheap jump scares, but there will definitely be players who find walking around the hotel and talking on the phone to be more tedious than terrifying. While I enjoyed the mystery, I'm not going to blame you if you quickly lose interest in Nicole's trip back home. With a blizzard outside and the nearest person miles away, the suicide of Rachel Foster has the perfect recipe for a freaky horror game. Unfortunately, the slow pace and technical problems will leave some gamers cold even though the thrills heat up in the final act. The good news is the mystery is compelling and the conversations between Nicole and Irving are often interesting. While it may not be as scary as it could have been and the drawn out timeline ultimately hurts the story, the suicide of Rachel Foster is a solid debut from a first time developer. Hey, thanks for watching our review. If you liked what you saw here, then you should know that we post new reviews and features almost every day. And here's the question I have for you. What is the scariest location in a video game? Look, it doesn't have to be a horror game, so let your imagination run wild. Let me see your picks in the comments below. In other news, we'll be back later this week with what has to be the dumbest quiz I've ever taken as well as a new episode of Defunct Games News with Lauren Risley. If that sounds good to you, then I strongly recommend you click that subscribe button and support what we're doing here. Until then.